Okay, so we move on to a new chapter. This is um, independent of what we have learned so far. So what we have talked about, the previous uh, three topics are all related to um, polynomial interpolation. That's why we um, took them at the same time. This one is a bit independent. In fact, if you look at some numerical introduction to numerical method textbooks, many of them actually start with this topic, okay, because it's new. So it's going to be soft. So what we will be learning is to find numerical solutions of nonlinear equations. Okay. So we'll do introduction. Let's set up the problem. Okay. So the problem is the following. So I have a function given, given the function f of x. Okay. This is a um, real valued. We don't talk about complex valued functions, real valued and plus, okay, probably nonlinear. If, because if it's linear, it's trivial, all right? So we don't even see that. My goal is now to find a root r for f. So what does it mean r is a root for f? f evaluated at the root shall be it's like find the zeros, right? So, so which means r shall be the solution to the equation f of x equals to zero, okay? Right. Okay, so since it's an introduction, let's be silly and look at some examples. And for each example, let's make some point. <laughs> Consider a quadratic polynomial f x. Let's put in some nice numbers, x squared. 5x plus 6. And I want to solve it, find the roots. Everybody knows how to do that? Quadratic polynomials. We do x plus 2, x plus 3 equals to 0. Is that right? How many roots do we find? So may I conclude that if f is a nonlinear function, then the roots might not be unique. It doesn't have to be unique. Think, think that f is sine of x, how many roots will it have? Infinitely many, right? It doesn't even have to be bounded, okay? So observation number one, roots might not be unique. That's quite okay. There can be multiple of them. There can be infinitely many of them, countably many. Okay, so second. Do you think if I give you a nonlinear function, there shall always be a root? Say I want to solve that one. Okay, it's quadratic polynomial because it's easier to deal with, to see what's happening. So what would that be? I can break the 10 into 4 plus 6, isn't it? Because the 4 will make a perfect square with the first two terms. And this is always strictly bigger than 0, right? So there might be no roots at all. So, because it's nonlinear, so anything is possible. Okay, and then the last one, that's really silly. A very, very silly one. It's okay, so I'm just trying to be nasty and putting some horrible looking function. Whatever you can imagine, you can throw it in, whatever you want. Okay, how about find the roots for that? I can throw in anything. In general, I give you a nonlinear function. I want you to find the root analytically exactly what would you say. Is it an easy task? It's not easy. It might not, it might not even be possible. Is that right? Do you agree? Let's at least say very hard or well, not possible. Okay, very hard 
to find. Exactly. Okay, so that is kind of a, the final motivation. So what we do now is then we give up on that and we go into numerical approximations. We want to find approximate values that's very close to the root you want. Okay, so yeah, okay, so the next chapter we'll look at the first method, usually the easiest one. Okay, so throughout this chapter we'll be learning quite a few different methods. Okay, so this one carries the name called bisection. Anybody that has heard of it? Have we heard about the bisection method to find roots? Nope, yep. Bisection meaning cut it in half and half and half. Are you always bisect it? Okay. Okay, it's okay. After today you will know it's a very simple method. So I need a function f of x. I want to find its zeros. I need some basic assumptions that is it has to be continuous. Okay, if it's not continuous, it has a jump, then you cannot define the roots in a nice way. Okay, then the, you have to generalize the definition. Okay, so let's say it is. So let's look at a basic idea of how I can design some iterations that after many runs, I'll get very close to the root. Okay, so let's illustrate this with a graph. One iteration illustrate this with a graph. So this is the plot of my function f of x, and let's say I just generically draw something. Say that's f of x. So you have to initialize your iteration. Let's say I kind of uh, randomly sample different values of f at different points of x, and I manage to find two points. Let's say um, this is A, and uh, this is a point B. Such that I look at the value at A, and I look at the function's value at B, and they have opposite sign. Is that clear? So, okay, so um, let's say I managed to find A and B such that F of A times F of B is less than zero. What can I conclude? What's special about this interval that I just found? There must be a zero somewhere between them. Why could you say that? Yeah, because it's continuous, right? Then you can apply that theorem. Is it right? Do we all see? You can see from the graph, if on one side, I mean, at A and B, the graphs are on the opposite side. It has to be connected. It has to cross the x-axis, and that's where the zero is, right? Okay, so you can conclude there exists a r on the interval from A to B such that f of r equals to zero. Okay? So this interval from A to B might be pretty big, and this claim is nothing because you might be pretty far away from the roots. I want a good approximation. Okay. So now what I do, I bisect it. I cut this interval exactly into half. I find the midpoint C. Is that clear? Okay. Now I find the midpoint C equals to A plus B half. And then I evaluate the function. Compute F at C. Okay, so in this example, I computed f at c, and I found that it's negative. So, f of c will have a fixed sign. And f of a and f of b, they have opposite sign. So no matter which sign f of c has, it will be opposite to one of them, either a or b. Agree? So in this example, it's opposite with b. I will choose this one now as my interval 
for the next iteration. Is that clear? Because then I know there is a root on this interval. And this interval now is half of the previous one. Now it's getting smaller and smaller and more and more accurate. Is that clear? And that's just the, the idea. So, okay. So I have to do a, a discussion. If f of c times f of a is less than 0, and then take, and then I can conclude that um, r, there will be r on the interval from um, a to c. Otherwise, okay, I have to still write if, if, um, f of c times f of b is less than 0, then r is on the interval from c to b. And then if you are so lucky that f of c identically equals to 0, and then you have found the root and you stop. But that we don't consider because you are not that lucky. It doesn't happen. <laughs> In general, it doesn't happen, right? You can say. Okay. And then that's one iteration, and then you nail down an interval that's half of the previous one, and then you repeat. Repeat this until certain criteria is met, right? Accuracy is met. Okay, so these I call stop criteria is met. Okay, so what do you think would serve as some good stop criteria? Can you think of some, you have to put an if test or maybe this could be a while loop. Let's keep checking, should I repeat in the while loop or should I jump out of it, right? So what criteria would be a good one? The absolute value of zero minus F of C. Is small? Yeah. Okay. So you are saying that my root R actually make F at R equals to zero. So if you find a C value, F of C shall be very close to zero, and then you think R is close enough to C. Is that right? Okay. So stop criterion will be just F of um C in absolute value is less than your tolerance, right? Whatever you set up. 10 to the negative 6 is pretty standard to use. Anything else? <coughs> this criterion could run into trouble. Let me give you something potentially not very nice. Say you have a function. Um, um, looks like this, and it's really, 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 really flat, and it comes up. Let's say x to the 100, okay? x to the 1,000, and you find a number here, 0 0.5 to the power 100, f of it is extremely small, and yet the root is 0, it's still far away. Do you see? I'm not saying it's a common criteria, okay? I'm just picking on it. <coughs> so, can you come up with something else? There's a hint. This has to be close to that point. So what would you say? That interval that you keep going down half and half and half, if it's really, really, really small, you can stop, right? So. At your level, B minus A at the level after many, many iterations. If this is really small, then you can stop, right? Is that a reasonable criteria? Mm -hmm. So what else? Let's say some function is so nasty, or maybe when you write the code, you're not careful. You wrote something wrong, and you end up in a, a dead loop, the pro program ends there. It just keeps going on. How do you prevent that from happening? 
you have like an upper limit of iterations? Exactly. You should have a counter, right? Starts with equal number of iteration is zero. And each time you iterate, you increase it by one. And you set a max number of it, OK? Say 100. And then no matter what, if these are met or not, you stop the program. So it doesn't go into that loop, OK? So max number of iterations met then you stop. So all of these are a decent, reasonable um, stop criteria. There's no reason why I can use only one of them. I could use combining two of them or use all of them, any combinations, right? I could, you require all three of them, okay? So any combinations. of the above. Is that okay? So can you visualize a programming code that you can write that carry out this? There will be some homework problems on that. All right. Okay. So the method is clear. Now let's do a little bit analysis. It's very soft analysis, don't worry. This is Okay, let me clean up more space. Convergence analysis. I want to see um, if <coughs> it, does it always converge and uh, how fast is it? Okay, so the first question, does it always converge? What do you say? provided that I initialized it, that my function is continuous, and I managed to kind of a through sampling find A and B such that F takes opposite sign. And then I started my bisection iteration. Do you think it will always converge? Will it always get closer and closer to the exact, to the zero, to the root that you want to find that's contained on the interval? How could it go wrong? <laughs> you know there is a root on the interval from A to B where you start with, right? And each time you have the interval, right? And you make sure there's a root on that interval. Eventually you squeeze, you get closer and closer to it. So it always converges, right? Very stable. So answer, yes, always. So it's a very robust method, okay? Very, very stable. Okay. So now I want to know how fast is it? What is the speed of your convergence? So this is the first question. This is the second discussion. Speed of convergence. Let's do a little bit soft analysis, okay? So consider an interval. Um, a zero, B zero. Now I'm gonna give them an index. So that's the initial interval A zero, B zero, and the initial mid value C zero is just that. And then initially you also know there is a root on the interval from A zero to B zero. Okay, you initialized it. Okay, so I want to define some arrow. I want to ana analyze it. Oops, this is soft. Say E0, what is the arrow? Well, you are guessing that C0 is your guess, so the arrow will be um, the distance between R and C0. Is that right? C0 you know, but where the, is the R you don't know, right? That's the, the location of the root. So how can we estimate this arrow here? Hmm? Your interval is from A0 to B0. This is your guess, C0. And R is on the interval between A0 and B0, and you don't know where it is. So what's the worst possible situation? If you want to estimate, you have to consider the worst possible situation. What will be the worst? The maximum of the function. Where the R is far away from C, is it? let's say i is extremely close to the boundary, then you may make a big error, right? So can I say this will be bounded by b0 minus a0 
have, for sure it's bounded, right? And I cannot do any better than that because I don't know where R is. That could just be the case, okay? All right, and now let's see, at a later level, Mm -hmm. So I just use some notation. Denote now at iteration number n, let's say this is my interval at iteration number n, okay? And Cn is the midpoint, okay? So this is at iteration number n. What can I say about the arrow En? which will be R minus C N. Is that right? And from the same discussion as we did here, well, we know by our procedure that the root would be on the interval between A N and B N. And C N is the midpoint, but I don't know where the R could be, so the worst would be still half of the interval length from A N to B N. Is that right? Same reason. So this is less than Bn minus An over 2. So how is this arrow related to the first arrow, say? So you know in bisection method, each iteration, this a, Bn minus An, the length, is shrinked by half. Is that right? So after n iteration, this will exactly be the initial one times 1 over 2 to the n. Agree? It just steadily shrinks to half. Okay? So now I want to derive one thing, that is, um, I give you a tolerance, given tolerance, error tolerance, error measured like that. Let's call the tolerance epsilon. I want to find minimum number of iterations. Okay, so it's a reasonable thing to compute because it's of interest, practical interest. So what do you want? You want the EN to be bounded by your tolerance and for EN you only have a bound which is B0 minus A0 half times 1 over 2N, right? So if I require the bound to be bounded then by epsilon, then I know for sure the arrow is bounded, right? So what you have to do is just to solve this inequality and write it as n bigger than something expressed in epsilon. Is that clear? So let's do this little piece of computation. Are we okay doing this kind of a computation? Hmm? I could move the 2n over and move the epsilon down. Can I do that? Let's do that. So I have b0 minus a0 over 2 times 1 over epsilon shall be less than 2 to the power n. So how can I get a hold on the n, which is in the exponent? What would I do to get it out of the exponent? <laughs> you take the Natural log, right? Any log will work. Let's do the natural one. If I do the natural log, ln b0 minus a0 over 2 plus, well, I don't have to do that. Let's just put all that in together, less than n times ln of 2. Okay, so you can rewrite it now. n will be bigger than, move ln 2 over down here, so ln of b0 minus a0 over 2 epsilon over ln of 2. It's something you can easily compute. Okay, So you would take the um, smallest um, natural counting number that's bigger than this value to guarantee the um, accuracy is met. Is that okay? Any questions? <sighs> okay, a quick discussion. We, al we always want to be the critic. What do you think is good and what do you think is not so good about this method? Pros and cons. 
well, we really don't have any meth method to compare with, so we just have to say. So what's good about it? Well, we discussed there, it's robust, it always works, always converges, it's very nice, very stable, okay? But each time you are making the interval half, you can only half your arrow through one iteration. As I say, you don't have anything to compare with. Later on, we will learn methods that does something dramatically better than this. Okay, so here, say for example, interval from A to B is size 1, and I give you an error tolerance 10 to the negative 6. You have to perform many, many, many iterations, right? Um, about 50, 60 iterations to get that accuracy. And later on, we'll learn some method that will converge, if it converges, in three, four iterations, extremely fast. Okay, so comparing to those future methods, which we don't know yet, this is very slow, actually. Okay, it's a very simple method. Okay, so of course, this is the first method, cannot be the best, right? So the topic will heat up, it will get very hot in a couple of classes.